On behalf of Pamela Rosenberg and myself, I'd like to welcome everybody to this year's annual Richard von Weizsäcker Lecture. It's a great pleasure and great honor to have our founding co-chairman, President von Weizsäcker and his wife, Mari Mariana, here again this year. And uh, I do want to thank all of those who made it possible, uh, Martin Zahm and Hanna Vordegam for the Stiftung Erinnerung, Verantwortung und uh, Zukunft, Bernd and Mary Ellen Schacke Schulz uh, privately and also via the Villa Griesebach, many others, and also Monika Sprut uh, for this year's lecture. I also want to give a special welcome, actually there are many people, but I especially to uh, Dieter Grimm of the Wissenschaftskolleg, who's been a uh, constant source of advice and, and mentorship. Uh, Susanna Baer from the Constitutional Court, and also uh, Susan Neiman, uh, the director of the Einstein Forum, uh, who held the Laudatio in honor of Professor Margulies three days ago uh, for the Bloch Prize in Ludwigshafen. Now, it should be obvious why one would want to have an, an endowed uh, lectureship in honor of Richard von Weizsäcker at the American Academy in Berlin. And in fact, every year I read at least part of the letter that Fritz Stern wrote on our behalf, soliciting <laughs> helping to solicit funds, and it's just so eloquent. I'll just read a little excerpt about uh, Richard von Weizsäcker. Um, so first, Oton Fritz Stern. The Federal Republic has been Germany's success story, and Richard von Weizsäcker has been one of the main architects of that success. Uh, the president is required to be above parties, and von Weizsäcker, by his integrity, dignity, and political wisdom, was predestined for that office. He used the office for what it ideally was intended, as the voice of moral authority. The speech he gave on the 40th anniversary of Germany's unconditional surrender is arguably the most important manifest of the German post-war spirit, a clear acceptance of the crimes of the Nazi regime, rigorous defense of Germany's Western democratic attachment. That speech must be compared to Willy Brandt's kneeling before the ghetto gates in Warsaw, the spoken and the silent gestures of Germany's acceptance of its anguished past. By reflection and character, von Weizsäcker is at once conservative and liberal, that rare variable <laughs> mixture of political traditions marked by affinity. And it goes on, but I do want to say that this is the reason that we've made this lectureship mm -hmm. into a moment in which we honor, actually honor ourselves, but we try to bring, from our point of view, a person to Berlin who also uh, is a voice of moral authority. We began with um, Jim Wolfenson. I have the list somewhere, but I lost it. We began with Jim Wolfenson. Uh, we've had Paul Volcker last year, Peter Seligman of Conservation International, and this year no one could be more perfectly uh, tailored to hold this lecture than this lecture, I think, than Avishai Margley. Avishai Margley is, where's Avishai? So I don't have to look at you. Okay, fine, yes. <laughs> uh, it, you know, there are many ways to speak about Avishai. Margalit, I was looking in to Michael Ignatius biography of Isaiah Berlin uh, this weekend, and Avishai has quite a few cameo appearances. If you look so closely at the work of the writings, the most important writings of Isaiah Berlin, then you see that uh, that Sir Isaiah's younger philosophical friend, Avishai Margalit, took some of the most important themes and developed them into uh, his own concern, into books. Uh, if you just look at the, the one of the greatest essays on the pursuit of the ideal and the last pages, uh, the, the language about the discussion of decency, of the pitfalls, but the importance of compromise, uh, in which he, on the one hand, valorizes the notion or of compromise, but says 
but warns us that it's not always the right road, that the search for perfection, he says, seems a recipe for bloodshed, no better even if it's demanded by the sincerest of idealists, the purest of hearts. And those incipient thoughts are played out in a way, uh, in Avishai's book on compromise and rotten compromises, that makes him, the, in many ways, the truest heir of Sir Isaiah. Although, in some ways, Avishai Margulit's scholarship and his thinking has had more direct impact on the public sphere, uh, beginning with uh, his role at the, in the beginning of the founding moments of the Peace Now movement and the decades of philosophically, philosophical and pragmatic reflections on the Middle East conflict uh, in the New York Review of Books, among other themes. So alone for that reason, and as uh, we were discussing earlier today with uh, Susan, that uh, there's no person in our common uh, experience who can bring more magic and surprise to a theme. And that's all we know, because what, what Benjamin says, that the key to uh, a successful continuum or exhibition is that moment of surprise. Uh, and very, we're all looking very much forward to Avishai Margaret's analysis of the predicament and potential in the Middle East tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gary, for your generous introduction. And needless to say that I'm, I'm greatly honored, in fact, flattered <laughs> to be, uh, to give the, and I use, since it's an American academy, I can use the expression, the president from Weizsäcker, because for the Americans, president is a title, not a function. And, uh, I'll start right away with a disclaimer. And, uh, I'm not going to give an analysis. I'm an Israeli, and I'll give a perspective of an Israeli of the Middle East, and especially on the two major, uh, two major events that happened recently, the what is called the spring in Egypt and the spring in Tel Aviv and in Israel. Whether the spring is the, the right word or whether it's just the beginning of the win a long winter, we shall see. But I'm not, my disclaimer is not a coiled plot to for, for humility and self-effacing. I mean it seriously. It's not an analysis, it's a perspective. It's not an overview from God's eye view or serve you or Ibersicht. It is from a view from downstairs, from the street of an engaged, on occasion engaged citizen and usually a concerned Israeli. And that's what it is and not more than that. I hope that I have something worth saying in the meantime. Let me start actually with a big claim, which is perhaps part of an analysis. There was a major shift in the Middle East. And the major shift has the following nature. Usually American order in each area, the Pax Americana in each area, consisted of putting three attributes under American control. Population, in the Middle East it's Egypt. Military might, at the time it was Israel, and economic it was Saudi Arabia. So in each region you try to basically control three attributes. Hopefully that one state has them all. Nigeria, for example. What happened in the Middle East recently is that there is a decline, or at least a relative decline, of these three forces. 
and in the outside rim of the Middle East, two Islamic countries, non-Arab Islamic countries, are on the rise. One is Turkey and one is Iran. And they make a bid on the Middle East. Both had historical roles in the Middle East. Both present high, powerful empires with rich history. And the Ottoman Empire ruled over the Middle East for, for 400 years. So, so they have memories, they have depth, they have culture, they are Islamic, but different, different sort of Islam. And uh, different styles of Islam. And let me say something about Islam, again from a perspective of an Israeli, not an Arabist and not an Islamic scholar. Islam was an instant success. In 30 years, Islam became, from, uh, starting from a few tribes in Arabia, and in no time actually became a world religion and a world empire. It took Christianity 300 years to become a world religion, the dominant religion of the Roman Empire. It took Islam 30 years. So it was a triumphalist religion. But Shia, and especially the version which is in Iran, was a defeated force in the struggle within Islam. And it was founded on a deep sense of humiliation, insult, and resentment, and persecution, history of persecution. So the culture of victimhood there was far more pronounced. There was no culture of victimhood in Sunnah Islam. On the contrary, there was an element of sort of almost a samurai ethos of accepting the world for what it takes, and tremendous confidence, of a, almost a triumphalist confidence, with the idea that a successful religion should be vindicated in this world as a, by, having, by triumphing, by having political power. Now, the experience under colonialism, especially under Western colonialism, undermined this image and created a sense of victimhood. And what we see is basically that a great deal of the political culture and the undertones of Shia penetrated more and more into the Islam mode of behavior and discourse. This is very crude but not uninformative. So this is somehow things that happened before the current events, a shift from the Middle East, the Arab Middle East, the Fertile Crescent, into the two powers in competition, Turkey and Iran. Now let me say something about the Arab Spring and the, and the Israeli Spring and springs in general. <laughs> in revolutions, structurally, we can find two phases. And I'll make the paradigmatic case the Russian Revolution. There is always a February revolution, and then there is an October revolution. <laughs> February revolution is spontaneous, lots of forces, Mensheviks, anarchists, SR, you name it, Narodniks of various kinds. The Bolsheviks are usually almost not there. So there is an anarchic atmosphere to it all. It comes usually, it's not, it doesn't lack organization, but many organizations competing. 
And then there is the second stage, the October, a coup d'etat in the revolution. The organized forces take hold on the revolution. Whether it's Jacobins or whether it's even, and it's true even in Iran. So this is a structural comment. I don't just mean Russia. And we had in our world the February Revolution. And now is the phase of the October, namely organization or sort of a Leninist view of it. Organize, 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 keep clear goals, and that's, you will be vindicated. So I think that one of the things that are happening now is really about organization and the role of organization. Now, lumping together Israel and Egypt under the title of spring, I mean, struck Dr. von Weizsäcker as really surprising, if not misleading. Well, the differences are huge and for everyone to see, but there is something that I would like to stress, a certain similarity. I think that, let me say something first about Egypt, then about Israel, and then about combining the two and where the similarity is. I think there is one form of government that typified many of the Arab states. And I call it Muhabarat regime. <coughs> Muhabarat is the Arabic term, well, basically it's intelligence, even military intelligence. But Muhabarat means all the internal security apparat. It can be the intelligence, the secret police, the various branches of secret police, the Praetorian Guard of the family that is in the center of the regime. There is always a family, it's Mubarak or Asar or Ben Ali. And the top class of the army from which people come and go from the Muhabarat to the Muhabarat. In all those countries, there was a strong, they also were, there was a strong ideology, let's say during Nasser time, pan-Arabism was a major ideology. There was Arab socialism. And the political imagination was shaped by a version of military Leninism, namely the avant-garde comes from the army and they have to modernize the state in short time, reallocate things, and create a different situation. And the, in the center, there is a party, the Ba'ath Party, for example. The party vanished, and the ideology lost its grip. And, the, and it became, at the end, almost an empty shell of this Muhabarat. Even in the heydays of the Stasi, it, the DDR wasn't a Stasi state. It, the party still could control the Stasi and fire the people. Or Yezhovchina in, in, in Russia in the 30s, it wasn't Yezhov who, who controlled Russia. So I'm not just talking about whether it's terror or that, but the point is about it's a structure that comes. There it was, I think, many countries really a Muhabarat. What they promised to the people is one thing, is stability. And stability created a sense of, uh, of justification. You don't have to say much. Stability is all that matters. Secular ideologies lost the appeal. Pan-Arabism ended uh, with the 67 debacle. 
Nasser, though he was the most, perhaps, this wonderful newspaper said, the most charismatic Arab since Muhammad. The, the, the idea was secularism and secular ideologies lost that grip. And there was an ideological vacuum, and it was clear that the only organized ideology is some form of Islam. I think still this is crude, but not uninformative. Now, what happened, I, the way I understand what happened in Egypt, it wasn't the events of Tahrir Square, although the target was Mubarak, because he embodied the regime, I think People in Tahrir Square understood by then that Mubarak days are numbered. He's, he's too old, too sick, and it's uh, within a year, two or so. We, we know that all despots are declared ill, and that's part of their attraction, because you always give the impression that they are there to be replaced, and you drag it as long as you can. <coughs> so there are always diseases spread for the, there is always diabetes to all of them or something. But eventually they die, and people knew that Mubarak is seriously ill. The issue was his son, Gamal. And Gamal wasn't just, it wasn't just the insult of creating a kingdom like, yeah, and that he will inherit it like the way Assad inherited place to Bashar. Gamal changed a great deal in Egypt. He brought, he, there was a strong process of privatization, changing the economy, which was very amenable and very, in the West was very much in favor. He was a favorite of the IMF. But he created, he alienated the father and the family, the ruling family, I think, from the army. First of all, he created a whole class of fat cats, people who started getting control, and I'll talk about it in a minute. And the feeling was that the army, especially the sort of the high echelon of the army, become more and more irrelevant to these people. They looked to them as sort of redundant people, people from the past. And the army didn't like it, and many people in the Muhabara didn't like it. So he had no sense really of connecting. The numbers looked very good, namely <coughs> the growth in Egypt looked very good, but the distribution wasn't very good, and it remained mainly in the top. Although the, the inequality in Egypt is not one of the one of the worst, but this kind of boom didn't divide, and I think the family lost a great deal of its base because of Gamal and, what, and the prospect of, of his policies uh, in the future. I think that something similar happened to the Shah family. Uh, the, and the word is greed. I know that greed is a discarded word because it looks sort of terribly moralistic and not part of politics. But greed is part of the story, namely not letting others have even a trickle down of what comes to the fore. In the case of the Shah, he could easily, I think, win the Bazari, and then he would have stayed. But even the Bazari didn't get anything started being more close and close to the clerics. And the minute the Elch Bazari sent his three kids who work <coughs> in his shop to the streets, you have already 150 youngsters in the streets revolting against the Shah. So basically, the numbers don't, the numbers of the, the economy in Egypt don't tell the story. Now here is the connection between Israel and in Egypt, although the two are very different. 
Israel had public wealth, public ownership that consisted of 55 to 60 percent of the wealth of Israel. If you take three major organizations, namely government, <coughs> the union, Histadrut, the general union, and the Jewish agency, there was a time that they owned something between 55 to 60 percent. That was the ratio of public ownership in Poland. And Israel went through accelerated change of privatization. And in both places, you find the same phenomenon. Actually, you find it all over. Namely, whenever there is a distribution of public ownership in a free market, there are bound to, you are bound to this to find a robber baron's class. In Israel, they are called the tycoons. In Egypt, I don't know what. But it's the f under, all, under all those names, this rose is the same. And uh, this created, in both communities, tremendous sense of resentment. I'll tell you in a minute how it, it is translated in real terms. In Tunisia, where it all started, the deal was different. The family of Ben Ali, yes, we are corrupt. I mean, this was the hidden message. Yes, we are corrupt, corrupt up to our neck, but you'll be also rich with us. In Egypt, it wasn't a message. And then Egypt had one thing that they should, you have to provide, I don't know what, 82 million pitas every day, pita bread every day. There are 82 million Egyptians in Egypt, eight outside Egypt, but 82 if the ratio is one pita per day. That's a new thing. There is always a battle to cut subsidies and most of the population live and really on those subsidies. And the minute you cut them, you alienate your base. All the insurgency started with things. Now, there is all those theories about whether states, the Euphrates, the Nile, creating hydraulic state, with a pharaoh in the center of it, centralized government because you have to regulate the river. You know it all. But Egypt had parla a parliament before Italy. In 1866, there was already a parliament in Egypt, and not a trivial one. <coughs> the whole picture of Egypt and depicting, as you sort of the time used to depict, Nasser as a red pharaoh, and then Sadat, and, and then with the sphinx-like emblems as if they are all pharaohs, that's a very misleading picture of what Egypt was. And even under a sort of colonialism, after the British colonial rule, uh, Egypt, like many countries that were under English, co British colonial rules, there was personal freedom, not in a collective liberty, or not, not independence, but a great deal of personal freedom and some political life, real life. So the whole picture of Egypt, is if it's a succession of pharaohs from time immemorial, is rather misleading. Now, what happens in all those places is a retreat of the states from the public, from the welfare state. And less and less commitment, that's happened, it happened dramatically in Israel, and it happened more and more in Egypt. And then sectori se sectors takes over. That's what happened with the religious parties in Israel, especially 
the one religious party that represents mainly religious, or not necessarily or even religious, Sephardi Jews, Jews from Islamic countries. Sectarianism is trying, you try through your political power, through the coalition arrangement, to gain more and more to your sector. Now, Israel was founded as a sectarian society. I was raised in a very sectarian society. Uh, the, the belo we belong to the labor movement sector that founded Israel. And uh, we bought our shirts from the sector, and we went to the school of the sector. And our sports club belonged to the sector. And the Israeli soccer squad consists of six from one, se uh, five from one sector, five from another, and one who belonged to the ultra, uh, ultra right. So and they, so actually everything was divided by sectors, and then something changed. Ben Gurion changed, and, and sectarianism and sectorialism lost its appeal, lost its the power, and there was a welfare state, and then with the decline and retreat of the welfare state, sectors resurged, especially the religious ones. They looked after the people, they gained power, they created community services, they looked after the ill, they looked after health, they, they basically became the substitute to the welfare state. This happened in Israel, it happened in Egypt. And that's really what the Muslim Brotherhood or the Hamas did, or the Hezbollah is doing in, in Egypt. I think that all those, uh, the, 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 all those communities, I mean, the, the, the discrepancies in income and discrepancies in standard of life are immense. So it looks as if there is something almost blasphemous in comparing. But the comparison is very much to the point. And the comparison, I think, a great deal of the certain of sort of the strength of the Islamic communities is really creating a welfare network on different levels, but a very effective one. Now, let me say some now. So what one more, more word. In Egypt, they call it Gumulkiya. Gumhuria is a republic. And uh, then they called it Republican Kingdom, they called to the, to the rule of Mubarak. With really suddenly, the, suddenly the Muhabarat became empty uh, and uh, there is a tremendous stress in the press about the role of the new media and how the <coughs> new media created how the new media created coordinated all the forces <coughs> and how the tahrir was enabled by facebook or twitter and so on i think it's it's maybe good for facebook public relation, I think the reality is, is more complicated. And I'll give you one example and then move to Israel. There is one thing that I think escaped the notice of many commentators and observers who know infinitely more than I do about Egypt. There are two soccer teams, two football teams in Cairo, Zamalek and Al Ahli. Zamalek is the prosperous neighborhood. al Ali is the people's team. It's like Chelsea and West Ham. <laughs> it even may be some of it like Celtics and the Rangers in Scotland, something along this line, when the rivalry is about the whole style of life, not just soccer. It's like the blue and the green in the Byzantium, when sort of racehorses is a whole where people believe whether they are monophysite or trinitarian depends whether you are in this party of horse races or not. Now, every year, 
there is a gain, the match between the two. There are two actually twice a year. And this is a world war. The whole Africa and the Middle East know that this is cat cataclysmic event is taking place. And there is nothing like it here. I don't even think that the Maracana in Brazil ever had this kind of attention. And, and when it ends, no matter what the result, there are skirmishes with, between the ultra fans of both sides and then the police. They were the only one who co all consistently confronted the police and the muhabarat throughout the years. And they did it not by Twitter, and not by they eventually maybe a bit, but really by the tam-tam uh, drums more than by anything else. And, and I watched a crucial day in Tahrir Square when Mubarak sent his thugs to attack the people in Tahrir. You remember this guy on the camel in this street? And I wondered who were the ones who faced them. Suddenly they were repelled, those who charged and attacked. And my reading it by the scarf that they had, that they were the ultra of both teams. And they were the one really to fight. So and I think that there are lots of ways of organizing things that took place then, not all of them. We know, definitely not I. But there is something that I do know, and I'm going to talk about something that I do know, and that's about Israel, or I think I know. What happened, what happened in Tel Aviv is, is exceedingly interesting. And Tel Aviv, in the case of Egypt, we know that in the election, the Salafists, the ultra, radical group, a sort of, of uh, Islamic, got 28% of the votes and they were under the radar. Seven million voters weren't noticed by the most astute observers of, the, of Egypt. They didn't even notice. Even people who were in the Muslim Brotherhood, when they had to estimate the strengths of the Salafists, they, they talked about six and one of them was very daring and said 7%. And they got 28%. But in Israel, things are more transparent and you know more or less they are surprised. But what happened was utterly surprising. And let me just describe the dynamics of it and then see where it leads. Israel. In Israel, there are three basic tensions. There is the conflict between secular and religious, between Jews from Islamic countries and Jews from Europe, and they are descended, and especially between Jews and Arabs, Arab Israelis who are Palestinian, and then, of course, the mega conflict with the Palestinian community, which is not it's an inter <coughs> which is an intercommunal strife. It's not a battle between, it's not a, it's not a conflict between states like Israel and Egypt or Israel and Syria. It's basically an intercommunal strife. All those conflicts take place in Middle East. But then in Tel Aviv, and Tel Aviv here I use the whole metropolitan area along the shore from Celia down to Nahum, but the narrow strip along the shore. Something mm -hmm. very interesting was created then. Let me, a police, a, a, a police state, not police state, police in the Greek sense. And a, a, a city state was created. And lots of the secular Asturian kids, youngsters, moved to Tel Aviv and created a Manhattan style of life, very secular, coffee-oriented, coffee house-oriented, <laughs> with lots of what in Prague after the 
the years after the communism, what they called when the Americans, the thousands or the hundreds of Americans came and populated the copy of the, what they called the, the, the Hemingways, each one writing the great novel or the great script. So there are lots of people, what is called creative people clattering into this urban area with lots of aspiration. And there is money there of high tech, which is an astonishing success in Israel, under 10% of the workforce in high tech and its vicinity. And uh, so Tel Aviv, and in this sense of Tel Aviv, it's a long, not all of Tel Aviv, of course, not the municipal, but by Tel Aviv, I mean this street along the shore, created a style of life which is very different from Israel. Almost an escapism from Israel, an island. Uh, it's not that the people there, the, the youngsters are not politically minded. Actually, they are more poli in a way more politically minded. And, but they even, there are standard, three standard deviations from where Israel is. The, they have to decide between mayor from the Labour Party and a, and a communist where Israel is, is way in the, on the right. So basically, they created a, li a st style of life which enabled a whole generation, middle class generation, to distance themselves from what they feel is hopeless in the situation. Uh, 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 the feeling, basically, I think, the undergrad, it's a dinner on the Titanic. It's a pleasant dinner, it's a nice dinner, but it's on the Titanic. And the icebergs are there, and they will hit us sooner or later. That's, so th there was always this feeling, and in now it's exasperated, and I think this created this, you know, tolerable way of life for the middle class kids. Life in Tel Aviv are expensive. So those who earned, I don't know, 10,000 10, shekels, half of it they spend on rent, uh, then they the rest on eating out. And the family, and they were subsidized by middle class families. I mean, 50% of their life was subsidized by middle class families. But Tel Aviv is a narrow street. The supply of flats and apartments was, is grossly inelastic. And uh, therefore, the prices went up. And the kids felt that they can't afford paying for it. And it started by revolt about the rent. Actually, it started by something that predated it, not by then. It's the cottage. Revolt, namely the cottage cheese. If Egyptians need pitas, Israelis eat cottage cheese. Why cottage cheese became such an important item, almost an emblematic item in the way of life Israelis live, I don't know. But this was an item that people could compare the prices to the other parts of the world, and they felt that they paid too much. So it started as something very local in Tel Aviv, a protest against the rise of prices, which meant for them being banished from the city-state that they like to nowhere. And while they started the protest, they started, people started talking, and there was an ongoing seminar for three months that people started talking seriously about politics, and about economics, and about taxes, and about distribution, and about social justice. And social justice became the main, the main slogan. In the, the biggest demonstrations ever in Israel took place under this slogan, social justice. And against, partly it was against the tycoon, but social justice. It started as an empty slogan, and as time took place, more and more people became informed in a very rapid time. 
But there was one thing that they all lacked. And this was basically the dundi, right from the beginning. The mistrust of organization. Obsession with procedures, how to give anyone or everyone his voice or her voice. I mean, they went into unbelievable length to represent every human and so on. No one will dictate, no one will come to the fore, no saliency of leadership. The media needed leadership, they didn't want. And at the end, there was no organization. And in Egypt, there was an organization, and there is an organization, that's the Muslim Brotherhood, that's the main difference. So I'm not here to advocate Leninism, not in my age. But uh, what I think, and uh, that's I think is very much part of the story, is really the issue of the organization and the role of organization in political life. There is one thing that was absent in the Israeli thing which is very surprising. Most of the people who were active were, let's broadly speaking, people on the left. The constituencies of the government of Netanyahu didn't join in. Their ambivalence on the margins, some of them were, it spread for developmental town. But basically, the base, didn't, I mean, the, the people who supported, the constituency that supported, didn't politically endangered the government. The Russian, what you call, the Russians didn't join in. The ultra-Orthodox didn't join in. The settlers definitely didn't join in. So the main pillar of the government, they were touched. I don't say that they weren't affected, but not in a grand way. The government at the beginning felt that they uh, are under threat, and they decided that they will co-opt the protest, and they will be sort of, by being nice to the kids. Uh, they didn't know how exactly to behave, but then when they sensed that there is no real threat in the base, they felt secure and could easily, and could basically ignore it. And that's actually was, what uh, took place. Now, am I talking for too long? Uh, so I'll, yes, the answer is yes. So let me say a few things just as a summary. I think one thing that troubles lots of people, and this will be my last point, is the role of religion in all of it. All right, we understand, I mean, it's against this, it's against that, but what religion has to do with it? And what from? Now, religion has a great deal to do. And you see it in the Israeli society, and you see it in the Arab society, in all countries, especially in Egypt. It's a merger, it's a collusion of two forces. One is an inert conservative constituency, people who are devout Muslim, conservative Muslim, but not ter weren't terribly political or terribly interested in politics. Then there were the political Islamists, sometimes even being trained as I mean, the Communist Party or in other leftist, you know, very politically minded, weren't terribly conservative or particularly learned religiously, and the two started meeting. Which means is the, f what I mean by that is the following. I think it's a unique phenomenon in the world that the only religion, at least in the West that I know, that gave up on principle as a principle stand on the public space is Protestantism. 
all other religions never gave up on the public space. Catholicism never, Judaism never, and Islam definitely not. You give up on the public space if you are weak, but not as a matter of principle. And we see now in Protestantism a resurgence by evangelism not to give on the public space and to control the public space. In the Middle East, the public space a great deal has to do with the women in the public space and what is called sexual morality or family values or whatever. And this, I think, happens in both communities, as different as they are. For, for many secular people, morality means morality, which has application to sexual behavior. Like they have uh, application to medical behavior. There, the, the religious perception is very different. You start, morality starts with sexual morality, and then by extension is to other dimensions. And this is a very different perception. And I think that what happens in those communities is, I think, a bid on the public space. And I think it's still an open fight. And the fight in Egypt is between the two models. Will it be like Turkey or will it be like Iran? If it will be, and that's my hunch and my bet for the future, if they will make it economically, if Egypt will be viable and economically viable, it will veer towards the Turkish model. It will be a flop, an economic <coughs> disaster. It will be more like Iran. And I'll stop here and thank you for listening. that time for questions. So we'll give you one moment to think about your questions. Thank you, Avishai, for a, a surprising and, and uh, insightful analysis of, in many ways, I, if I understand it correctly, I mean, we've spoken about this, there's, you don't see the vehicle of political will in, in Israel, whether it's a kind of Lenin, the Len, you don't see the Leninist or the soccer teams prepared that are there to effect change. Um, I guess I, I want to move, though, to a, a more drastic question. I was hoping you would have a more optimistic, uh, something more optimistic to give us. Uh, and in fact, the pessimism seems widespread, even to the White House. President Obama has, is not meeting with Prime Minister Netanyahu. It's not necessary, even in the last phase of this a very, what could be a very close election, and uh, I think it was published in recent days that that our other honorary chairman, uh, Henry Kissinger, uh, was quoted at a dinner party as saying that he thought the state of Israel would not exist in, in 10 years. That's very, in fact, we've heard him say that in other contexts. These, nothing that you said has um, even, me. yes. Well, I know that in many, with many people, when they talk to me how, how Israel is doomed and what the situation in Israel, how horrible it is, many of the Israelis, I know that they talk about their health. Namely, they project on Israel all the troubles. So I know that if someone is suffering from heart condition, then I know that his account of Israel will be very gloomy. And lots of people project and I almost can diagnose what people feel like by the way they talk <laughs> about Israel. <laughs> no, well, I think that the issue is optimism or pessimism is, a, I think, don't do justice to the situation. The, the, the situation is the following, and let I will state it very clearly, my take. I don't see in the foreseeable future the forces that can change the status quo. I don't see it. 
But I also know that there are what you call black swans. A black swan is a totally unexpected thing, like the way you expected me to be unexpected in the lecture. <laughs> <laughs> Namely, a black swan is, uh, you know, that uh, there was this generalization that all the swans are white. Then in, in Australia, they found black swans and were utterly surprised. So things can happen in that will change the situation so dramatically that everything that we say here, gloom and doom, can look so utterly different. And the situation will can be read so utterly different that uh, it will be meaningless. So really, there is one thing that we learn from the 20th century. We are not terribly good in predicting anything. <laughs> I ended my bet with a bet because that's what you are expected to say at the end of a lecture. But uh, I don't trust m I don't trust people's uh, account. All the people who, all the events that happened in Egypt and Arab uh, were declared by all the experts as impossible. And after they happened, they all said that they were necessary. <laughs> 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 so, uh, so I'm not. I don't. I don't. Uh, so, uh, being pessimistic or not, is if you ask me, do you see the forces that will change it? Um, my answer is no. But this doesn't mean anything what will happen because we really are not good at it. And that's, I mean, the main thing about the future we are, uh, yeah. Well, we are not even good in predicting the past. <laughs> <laughs> Great. <laughs> uh, Leslie Collard is my name. Um, you introduced the United States at the beginning of your remarks, and at the end, it seemed to be irrelevant almost. Is this y your conclusion that basically um, whatever happens in the United States, whether an administration puts pressure on, on Israel to do something, or whether there's a, a trend away from the, uh, the hardline views of the uh, APAC, among American Jews, all of this, uh, would you say, is this irrelevant? No, of course, it, uh, relevant is not a word. I mean, they, they can determine, they can determine what will happen. I mean, it's, it's, the American can call the shots, but they won't. But they haven't until now. No, well, I mean, they haven't done it, and, and I don't predict that they will do it. Namely, it's not that they cannot, they won't, because the, the nuisance value of Israel is immense for all politicians in America. And even after the election, there will be by-election, I mean, there will be elections for the Congress, and they will be pressured by the congressman to Obama don't go into it. And he started very promisingly in, in Cairo's speech, which was really a very good one, and a very good beginning. And like many others, I just simply just dropped it. And I think there are so many crises in the world, so many places in the world, if this is my and I mean, Syria now is and Syria now is the main issue, and uh, they people even find the whole Israel is sort of Israel was always at the center of attention, irrespective of its size and that, because it was a perfect stage. You came there, I mean, journalists can stay in Tel Aviv in half an hour. They are in in the middle of all events go back to the hotel and can have facilities to report. You come with a helicopter, right away you have all the holy sites that tell all the world how important the thing is. And therefore it was, it got a tremendous saliency, irrespective of its politics. Now I think people have got bored with it. Even in America, it's more yawning. Yes, I mean, people go through the motion and they talk about it, or what, 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 but uh, if you ask me seriously, will they do something about it which costs, which I, I, I doubt it. That's all. Not that they cannot, they are the only one who can. <laughs> and I think that what Netanyahu now did was a tremendous, unbelievable, crazy gamble. Before Israel gambled on the United States on the expense of the rest of the world. The rest of the world doesn't count, but America is what that counts. Now they bend, now he gambles on half of America and maybe the, half, the losing half, I hope the losing half. <laughs> 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 and 
that's uh, yeah. But so, but if you ask me, all right, yes, then Obama will come back, and now it's the last term, and he will want to end with a glorious achievement, and what means more than the Middle East? Well, I mean, I don't know. I mean, uh, if you ask me seriously, do I believe that they will do something serious? I don't think so. I don't think. So. Uh, you ended by describing an alternative for Egypt, and you made the outcome dependent on the economic development of Egypt. Uh, so I guess my question is, is there a similar alternative for Israel? And, uh, on what will the Israeli outcome depend, if there is such an alternative for Israel? You know, in Egypt, the economy means basic. We don't talk about economy. We talk about really basics. Can they provide... Uh, 82 millions with enough food. And uh, Egypt now, there is a great, a, a very serious decline in the birth, birth rate. And there is, Iran is the most glaring success in controlling birth control, actually in the world, I think, if I'm right. Mode, I think in any case, I think more successful the Chinese without the coercion of the, the brutal coercion of the Chinese. But still, when I was a student, Egypt consisted of 21 million people. Now we, Cairo is 21 million, so I'm tired, the metropolitan. <laughs> so the, the size of the problem is unbelievable. When we saw economy, it's not growth or all those indicators, it's really providing Food now, when food costs go up by the day, competing with now the with the, with China and with India on grains and so on, so this will become more and more difficult. Uh, I think that there is resilience there, and I think cleverness. I think the Hamas surprised everyone by by the, the, the fact that they ran Gaza under unbelievable conditions. So maybe they will do, I don't know how they will do it. But if they will succeed in providing enough food, I mean, on the, on the sort of, really I'm talking about me, but sort of this kind of diet, then I think they will survive it. If, they, if suddenly there will be a real problem there, which might, which might happen, then I don't know. The tourism stop, the economy is in a standstill menu, so I don't know. You said there are things that the U.S. could do, although you doubt that they would do them. Indulge me in a little fantasy for a moment. Uh, Obama gets a second term, inshallah. Um, and could what concrete steps could he take? That's the first part of the question. And the second part of the question is what kinds of influence or pressure can those of us who care about these things uh, use to influence him to do so. I'm an optimist. Well, I mean, the, the name Kissinger was invoked here uh, after the 73 war. Uh, there was a negotiation between Israel and Egypt while he was there. And the issue was whether Israel will retreat before the Gibi Straits or after the Gibi Straits in Sinai. Now, those are myth no one even remember what it, the issue was. And uh, Israel refused. It was a new government. Rabin was the prime minister, the new prime minister. And then there was Paris and uh, Alon, and they called, I mean, there were three of them. It was the second triumvirate of Rome. I mean, they hated each other so intensely that they couldn't agree on anything. And they, and then Kissinger declared reassessment. And all it meant was to slow down providing the Israeli Air Force with uh, parts, I mean, substitutes for the Air Force. And the message was, I mean, they understood it in five minutes. And they went to the Gibi where he wanted them, I mean, the other side of the trail. So, I mean, Israel is so utterly dependent on Gaza that if you really want to pressure Israel, I mean, if you really want to stick your neck and take the risk and fighting in America and then against the evangelists and the and, and so on, 
and getting all those phone calls from all over, and how dare you, and you're betrayed. And all. I mean, if you are willing, if you really want to, then you feel, you know, Israel cannot, I mean, uh, that, and that's, so everyone knows it, you know, about Palestine. Even, I don't know about Palestine, everyone. I don't say everyone, I mean most. <laughs> <laughs> So now, in, in terms of pressure, the issue is, is like, as I said, I mean, you need real sort of determination and stubbornness and belief in the whole thing and a sense of mission. And it's, uh, it's too much. Th this world is too complicated. It's now the crisis in Syria is momentous. This is pocket money in terms of handling the crisis. So it's, uh, what's in it for Obama? So many will say he's cold, or is that? No, I mean, the, so the Jews is not. Yeah, they doesn't have re the revivalist, uh, you know, sort of the, the, the revivalist uh, yearning of Carter and uh, or Clinton. It's all for the best. Uh, the issue is whether he wants it. I th I doubt it. I think he tried something to do. He felt the cost of it immediately that it's too much of a hassle. And he retreated right away. And uh, now we are, I know that, uh, so f and people believe that the end of the election is, the, and let's assume that Obama will, that's what you assume, that Obama will be elected, that the end, that's the end of the election. No, America is a permanent campaign. It's not a permanent revolution, but a permanent campaign. So you, there is always a campaign there, and always someone will pressure them not to get into it. And that's my best bet for what it's worth. Uh, one, one more thing, <laughs> what to do. I think we have <laughs> hope against hope. You have, to, you have to do whatever you do, and that's what I think I do. Fight as if the uh, odds are for you. But uh, I know that the odds are against you. So you do, like you, you fight cancer, you fight something that when the odds are low, you, you don't give up just because the odds are against you. But to delude yourself that the odds are for you because you have to be an optimist to convey to Brimov and or to radiate vitamins from your teeth uh, and brimming with a sort of hope uh, and look sort of uh, 40, uh, 45, Angle uh, to the future. No, I, that's not. You fight. That's what you do. Um, my, my name's Daniel Tiffany. I'm a Fulham Fellow here at the Academy. And um, I, I wanted to raise a question about your thesis about the, the need for organization in this moment. And, and I understood uh, your contrast between the, the, the cottage cheese rebellion and the, the efficacy of the uh, the religious-based social organizations, as, as um, and I saw that in American terms as a contrast between the Tea Party and the Occupy movement, in in essence, um, and in in that your thesis about the need for organization would suggest that the Tea Party would prevail, because they have organized yeah. and they've penetrated yeah. uh, the the, the, the political institution yeah. and. And yet there's a possibility that that organization uh, will not prevail. Um, there's a possibility that the, the, that the Occupy movements refrain from organization and possibly even the idea that they occupied public space as a way of withdrawing from public space. That is to say that, they, um, that it was based on principle and not weakness. But my question is, if the outcome were to be that um, that organization doesn't prevail, and that the lack of organization of the Occupy movement as a moment that, let's say, galvanized uh, a, a recognition of of, of Obama's uh, significance, how you would how you would view uh, the value of that lack of organization? It's a painful question for me. And uh, we, uh, I was brought up in an anarchist home, my mother in any case. And I think the first book I read in Hebrew without dots was Krapotkin. <laughs> so for me to talk like a Bolshevik, 
is a bad thing. And we hated them. We hated them intensely. So it's not that I don't feel the, the attraction of doing it that way. But uh, so it's not that uh, I'm now here to uh, sort of organize, organize, organize. Uh, what was your? Yes. Yeah. No. 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 Wait. I don't remember, but I think Lenin said, had I been a teacher in Siberia, I would have teach the students to write all the, in the, the definition of the word uh, organize. I think that was it, or something along this. That's not the matter. What I'm saying is that I really believe revolutions are not done by the organized forces, and they take off. Now the point is, do you have enough of a civil society as real institutions in which you have a sort of solid institutions that can take over without really coup d'etat? Uh, I think in Israel the chances are much better than in Egypt. I think in, in that sense the Arab world, the, one, the civil society is very weak in that sense. That's not true about Israel. The civil society in Israel is a strong civil society. But, uh, but, uh, but to carry it on, that's a, that's a difficult task. And, uh, and some measure of organization should be taken. The, the, how many, the doses that you have to, to drop are a problem. Nabukov said that uh, Russian were fed on a cocktail of Schlegel and Hegel and drops of Feuerbach. <laughs> <laughs> uh, bitter drops of Feuerbach. Now, my problem is really how many bitter fo drops of Feuerbach you need into this talk. That's basic. And I don't know, I don't have a general answer. If you, guys, if you ask me what is my overall sense of the situation is, I would say, that I don't see that in Israel, I think that what happened won't be forgotten. It, it will mutate in very different ways. I don't know in which way. But, uh, but I'm afraid that, and this I think with the, with the in, in the States, I think your analogy is exactly the right analogy. And I think that what you see with the Occupy is also obsession with procedure on the expense of real uniting and doing something else. And uh, my family moved from the East Maghreb, became in the Union, and, and, and uh, I started the, I, yeah, you need, you need organization. How much organization and how not to be a Bolshevik? And how, how the, that's, a, that's a serious problem. And you can't get it right a priori. You do it by trial and error by, and by good luck. Debunked the Twitter view of history, the history of the Arab uh, Spring, and uh, and in, in everything you've said and and your writings, um, like Holbrook, have all brought a very unconventional and irreverent view of the problem a at hand. That's what makes this the perfect American Academy evening. It was it was Holbrook and. I, and quoting, who quoted Isaiah Berlin, in fact, that, uh, so, and this is misquoting Isaiah Berlin, but given the uh, urgency and the violence of the problems in the world, we have to deploy every possible resource, intellectual and otherwise, uh, to address the problems of the age. This is something that uh, Holbrook has devoted his life to, you, you yourself, President von Weizsäcker, and thank you very much for this evening. And now comes the informal part over coffee and whatever. Thank you.